Good morning. In this Solidity tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to deploy upgradable proxy contracts to the Ethereum network. Let's dive into how these contracts work. An upgradable contract has two parts. It has the proxy itself, which is the address that the users will call. So when you make an Ethereum transaction, like when you sign something, you're always calling a contract address. And then you have an implementation contract, which is a separate second contract, which contains all the functionality for the decentralized application. So the proxies contract's job is to route the user's calls and the data through to the implementation contract and route any return data back to the user. The reason these contracts are upgradable is it because it has a function within the proxy contract which allows the developers or a multi-sig wallet to upgrade the implementation address. So what they can do is they can go and deploy version 2 of the uh, protocol and then they can update the implementation address to that contract address and then users doesn't actually have to change anything. They can still route their transactions through the proxy address and they'll be just routed through to a different implementation. Obviously, this introduces some layers of centralization and there's some dangers which I'll talk about at the end of this video. Yeah, so let's look at an example. Today, we're gonna to be using the example from my blog post, which if we scroll down, there's a transparent proxy contract example and one we're gonna be doing is the UUPS proxy example. So we're gonna copy this code. I'm gonna go into Remix. Let's get rid of these. And we're gonna paste this in. So you can see here, we've got a, we're using the Open Zeppelin libraries, which is gonna provide the logic for our contract. But this V1 contract also includes the business logic. In this case, it's just a simple kind of set value, get value. So we're gonna pass a variable in and we can get that out again. And in a real production environment, that would be kind of the logic behind what we're trying to do in a contract, whether it be a token contract or whatever. We then also got a proxy contract, which is a very simple contract, which just takes the address of the implementation, which is this V1 contract. And that's gonna act as our entry points when everything we do to interact with it, we're gonna do through the proxy contract rather than the actual implementation itself. Because the data storage is different, the data is actually stored within the proxy and not within the V1 contract. So if you call the same function on both contracts, the proxy and the V1, you'll get different answers. Let's go ahead and compile these and deploy them. I'm going to be deploying today to the Sepolia Ethereum testnet. Everything on testnet is it's not real funds. You can't lose anything, so it's, safe, it's quite a safe way to do it. You still use kind of a testnet wallet or something that's not got anything valuable in it. Let's go ahead and deploy this. That'll take a few seconds to go through and then we're gonna verify that using Etherscan. So let's copy this contract address, go into the Etherscan plugin, you can get this from here. You also need an Etherscan API key. So let's place that contract address in, select my contract V1 and click verify. So it can't locate the contract code, I'm not sure why. There we go, that's gone in. So now let's open up Etherscan, making sure we've got the Sepolia testnet Etherscan, not the main Etherscan.io, because that'll be for mainnet. And you can see that contract's been verified. We can do things like read the contract here. Um, but like I said, what we want to do is use this just as an implementation. We're not really going to do anything with this contract. What we will need is the contract address again, which is that 0x1e8, this one here. And we're going to now deploy the proxy contract. And we've got to pass in two values here. We've got to pass in the address and the bytes value. We don't want anything for the bytes, so we just put 0x, which is basically blank. We're not passing anything through. Let's go ahead and deploy that. And there you go, we've got a proxy contract. We want to verify this on Etherscan as well so we can interact with it. So I'm going to put in contract address. This. Uh, it's my proxy contract, my contract proxy, sorry. We need to add the logic address and the data. The data was 0x. The logic was the original implementation. And it's a proxy contract, so we also need to put the implementation in here. Let's try that. Doesn't like it. I think there's a, uh, we need the 0x values the full string of the null bytes in 
Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, that's got it. So this is just the, the string, again, it's on the blog post, um, it's a little gotcha. You need to send the data input as a full 0x0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 32 byte string. Let's check this is verified in EtherScan. And we haven't got a tick here, but we've got the reader's proxy and writer's proxy. If we click on that, you can see we've got this information and we've got all the functions here that we need to use. So let's connect to this by EtherScan now. Let's initialize the contract. I'm going to put my testnet address in here. I'm just going to copy this. Initial owner will be me. And we can set the value of this to 123. Once that's processed, we can go to read the proxy and we can connect this, get value. You can see what one, two, three. So that business logic is working. We're kind of taking that logic from the V1 implementation and we're executing it through the proxy contract. Now, the whole idea of proxy contracts is it lets you upgrade it. So now let's do a upgraded contract. I'm gonna take this V1 code, I'm gonna copy it. I'm going to go into V2, I'm gonna paste this in. And I'm going to leave it all the same except the return value. I'm just going to return 69,420. So you get a little warning here, but that's fine. It's just saying, what is it saying? It can be restricted to pure. That's absolutely fine. We'll leave that as it is. And we're going to deploy this contract. And call it V2 just to avoid confusion. And let's go ahead and deploy that. I've got my new contract address. I can verify this, and you probably should. So the new contract address is contract v2. It's not a proxy contract because it's the implementation. No, it doesn't want to do it. And for some reason, it doesn't want to do it. Let's try start up a new instance of Remix. Sometimes this helps when you're having this issue with verifying contracts. Let's save that. Change that back to 0.827. Compile the contract. My contract v2, put the address in here. Oh, we're still on there. Remix VM, we want to be on injected MetaMask. Try it out. And that's gone through. Perfect. Let's close down that instance of Remix. I'm not sure there's some kind of bug in Remix. By the time you watch this video, hopefully it will be fixed. Now let's go to write as proxy. So we're back into the proxy interface here. We're not interacting with the V2 or the V1 contract itself. We're doing everything through the proxy. So we've got this upgrade function. This is our own function. It just makes it a little bit easier to pass through. We just need a new implementation address. So let's go and grab that. My contract V2. So this BB4 address, let's write that. Just thinking about it, let's confirm the transaction. And this is gonna upgrade our contract from V1 to V2. So in a production environment, this would be a significant upgrade to the contracts. It's also a security risk, obviously, because you've got the centralization about whoever has the control to do this. They can essentially change the logic of the underlying smart contract. Double check that transaction has gone through. And it's gone through, perfect. And now if we read the contract as proxy, and we're gonna reset this, connect to Web3 again, and get value. You can see we've got 69,420 because it's using that new upgraded function in the V2 contract. And we're doing all this through the same contract address, which is the proxy contracts which is what we'd give to our end users. 
One thing I'd like to mention is that this kind of moves away from immutable code. By creating upgradable contracts, you're adding in a layer of centralization. If anyone gets hold of the private keys to the developer's wallet, or they can gain control of that, then they can upgrade the functionality to whatever they want. And people that are interacting with that contract might not know what they're interacting with. And there's all sorts of malicious things you can do if you have the permissions to upgrade those contracts in the background. I think one of the superpowers for blockchain developers is the ability to deploy immutable code on decentralized networks. And this moves away from that. There's certainly times where it is useful if you're kind of deploying trading systems or something for yourself and there's no real need for decentralization. But if you're doing something for users, then decentralization is very valuable from a security perspective and an ideology perspective. For that reason, I wouldn't say this should be your default. It's a tool in your armory, but certainly not something you should use on every single contract. I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you want to learn more about blockchain development and decentralized finance, subscribe to the channel and check out my blog at jamespacini.com. Thank you for watching.